Tonight's speaker comes to you uh, from a career in big particle tech. She's one of, uh, one of the country's best particle physicists and communicators of science, and first started her long commute to CERN, uh, to the big hole in the ground in uh, the, the border between France and Switzerland, uh, stuffed with magnets that are so powerful they can uh, accelerate matter to close to the speed of light, and uh, sensors so fine they can uh, trace the path of a single subatomic particle. Uh, years ago, when, it was, when there was still the, uh, the LEP there, rather than the uh, Large Hadron Collider. She's since worked in uh, Fermilab, the big particle accelerator in the States, and now works uh, looking at antimatter through uh, examining quarks for the LHC. Uh, the LHC is not just a massive tunnel. Uh, it's, it's the work of thousands of physicists and engineers, uh, 50 million lines of computer code all going towards, not directly working towards a, a technological aim, but uh, the aim of understanding some of the fundamental things about our cosmos, because we, as humans, more than almost anything else, want to understand. Tara's in a uh, uh, better position to understand than almost anybody else, so I'm going to hand over to her. Uh, we'll take questions later on. Please welcome Dr. Tara Shears. So good evening, everybody. So Ian and I were having a bet before we started as to who would sort of forget what they were going to say first. So, <laughs> so you'll have to excuse me if I do it more quickly. So this talk is all about particle physics. Um, particle physics is the branch of science concerned with understanding the universe through the study of the very smallest constituents inside it. So my challenge and your challenge in the next 50 minutes to an hour is to learn about the whole thing. So I'm going to start off just by giving you a very brief introduction to the subject. I'll tell you what, it, what we know about the universe in terms of particle physics. But then, importantly, I'm going to tell you what we don't know. Because it's by studying what we don't know that we push our understanding of the whole universe forward. And I'm going to tell you about three of the biggest questions, the biggest unanswered questions we have in physics today that particle physics might help us shed light on. Now, the only way we're going to move our subject forward is by performing experiments. And in the second part of my talk, I'm going to bring you right up to date to the frontiers of what's happening in our research by giving you the latest news from our experimental facilities. Most notably, I'll be talking about the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, which is our newest and most powerful particle uh, physics facility, but I'll also mention other notable things that have been going on in the last year as well, because it would be mad to leave them out. And then I hope by doing this, by giving you a flavour of the LHC, what it is, how it runs, how it's running, that you can see what the LHC has shown us so far. So by the end of my talk, it's my aim that you'll be able to judge for yourselves how we're doing at uncovering the universe's secrets with the Large Hadron Collider. So you have to come back and revisit your knowledge of particle physics at about 8 p.m. to see how we're doing. Right, so let's start off with what particle physics is about. I mentioned it's about understanding the universe. Well, there are many branches of science that try to understand the universe, and I have tried to summarize everything we know in a very, very general and brief sense on the picture behind me. This is a time history of the universe, so it starts, let's hope I don't break anything with this. Um, so it starts with the Big Bang on the left, a hugely energetic fireball, which we thought, which we think brought everything in the universe into existence, that then expanded rapidly outwards as a function of time, which is running from this side to this side behind me, until we get to the universe now, some 14 billion years later. Now, the very early universe was very, very different to the universe we know now. It was very, very hot, very, very dense. And if you could look inside it, you didn't see planets and you didn't even see atoms. You saw the ingredients of atoms. You saw fundamental particles that make up everything moving around in a free state. 
Now, as time went on, the universe expanded. And as it expanded, it also cooled down. And at various times in its history, it became energetically more viable for this matter to start to clump together into new forms. So after fractions of a second, we get protons and neutrons. And then after a few hundred thousand years, eventually we get atoms. And then much later on, we get planets, stars, galaxies, and ultimately us. Well, this is what we think happened. And how we can put that to the test and how we can improve our knowledge is to test it experimentally. And on this end, that's quite easy because we can look at the universe through telescopes. We can send out probes to take samples of anything if it happens to be close enough to us in the universe. And we can compare that to what we think happens through astrophysics. Uh, so the universe around us now and in the sort of the fairly near past is well understood. But if we really want to understand the universe, we also have to understand how it got here, how it got to this position. And that means understanding what went on in the very early universe just after the Big Bang. And that is not so easy. We can't use telescopes to look back in the universe beyond about 300,000 years because the universe was opaque before this time. So if we want to know what was going on inside the universe, what it was composed of, what the matter in it, what the stuff in it was doing, we have to quite literally recreate these very hot, very dense conditions in the laboratory. And that's what we do in particle accelerators. And that's where particle physics comes into our whole understanding of the universe. We use it to fill in the blanks as to what happened just after the Big Bang. And we use it to fill in the blanks to tell us what goes on inside matter at this very deepest level where we're literally studying the building blocks of matter. Now, we've been carrying out experiments in particle physics for many years now. And these experiments have given us a very coherent and consistent picture as to what forms the universe when you're looking at it in these tiny, tiny scales. And what we've realized is that the universe if you decompose everything that you've seen in it, it's formed of combinations of 12 fundamental types of particles that make up matter. There are six of a type we call quarks and six of a type we call leptons. And that's fairly simple. And in fact, our life around us on Earth is even more simple than this because we don't even see all of these particles. We're far more used to just a fraction of them. We're used to up and down quarks over here, collections of which make up the protons and neutrons and atomic <laughs> nuclei, which are then orbited by electrons over here, a type of lepton, to make atoms. And that's all we're really used to. These other particles that I've listed up here are more common in higher energy environments than we typically have around us here on Earth. Now, that's matter. And what knits it up to make the universe look the way it does are a small number of fundamental forces. So let me just rattle through these. There is the weak force. Now, this is responsible for radioactive decay, and it affects every single one of our fundamental matter particles, or fermions, as we sometimes call them. And this is conveyed by different types of particles that we call force-carrying particles, or bosons. <laughs> and for the weak force, there are two types of these, Ws and Zs, as they're known. There's also the electromagnetic force, which is most familiar to us because it's driving my laptop, the projector, the lights in here, the cameras, and everything else. We know that that acts on anything with an electrical charge. <laughs> Some of our fundamental particles are charged, and so those experience this interaction too. And this force, again, we, we consider as being conveyed by force-carrying particles. In this case, it's photons. Photons of light do the job for us. And quarks, in addition, and this is what makes quarks different to leptons, feel another force called the strong force. And it's a strong force that stops positively charged protons from breaking apart atomic nuclei because it's an attractive force and it's strong enough to overcome the electrostatic repulsion that they would otherwise feel. And this, again, is conveyed by particles that we call gluons. And that's basically it for particle physics. It's an incredibly, incredibly simple universe to have when you decompose it and you get down to this level. However, it's not quite the whole story. I have missed out one really important force here. Can anybody tell me what I've missed out? Yes. 
Yeah, you've all seen through my argument quite quickly. <laughs> there's gravity. Of course, there's gravity. Very, very important. It's responsible for the large-scale structure of the universe. You experience it. It acts on mass. It's keeping you stuck to your seats. All of our fundamental particles have mass too, so they should all experience this force as well. However, gravity is so much weaker than the other forces that we tend to ignore it in particle physics. And, I'm, and I apologize for that, but just bear in mind that for the moment, gravity is not contained in our picture of the universe. So there we have it, three forces that we know about, well, one extra that we know about as well, but which we have ignored, a small number of fundamental particles. Now, we even have a picture for how these forces knit matter together. We think that a force is conveyed by means of an exchange of a force-carrying particle that's exchanged between matter particles. And we can encapsulate this sort of interaction mathematically in equations that form the basis of our theory of particle physics. And this theory is wonderful. It's, it's really simple in some sense. It's so simple that you can actually write it on the front of a t-shirt and you don't have many symbols there, which is always reassuring. And it's also very, very deep. And not only that, but this theory is extremely good. We haven't yet made an experimental measurement that disagrees with any of its predictions. This theory behind me is so good that we call it the standard model. Well, yes, exactly. With a name like that, you know we're heading for a fall. And the thing is that good though this theory is, fantastic though it is at predicting the outcome of our experiments, we know it's not the whole story. We know it's not the whole story because you've already seen that we don't include gravity. And that's not because we're being lazy. It's because we just do not know how to describe gravity using the same mathematics as the other forces doesn't fit into the equations. The theory doesn't explain many fundamental things that we see, which a very fundamental theory should be able to do. So we regard this tremendously successful theory as a sort of effective theory. We think that there's a deeper underlying understanding of the universe to be had, and it's our aim to try and find this. So, that's the good news, if you like, about particle physics. That's what we understand. Now, I want to tell you about some of the things that we don't understand. I'm going to move on to the, the known unknowns, to use someone's phrase. The, the things that we're trying to find out that we know we don't know at all. The first question that I want to tell you about concerns a very simple property of matter, mass. We touched upon it when we talked about gravity. Now. We're all very familiar with mass. We all have it, some more than others. Our fundamental particles have it. But we don't understand why. And this is the problem. Because our theory, left to its own devices, just predicts everything to be massless. So we don't know what causes particles to get mass. And we don't know why different particles have different masses. It's unknown. But we do have a theory, actually, that tries to explain it for us. And it's not a new theory. It was first put forward by many people in the 1960s, amongst whom was a man called Peter Higgs. And this theory tries to explain mass as a property a fundamental particle gets by means of its interaction with a new type of particle, and which unimaginatively we call the Higgs particle. So this particle is responsible for giving mass to particles. And the amount of mass a particle gets just depends on how strong that interaction is. It's a very, very simple picture. And in fact, the importance of this theory is more than that. Because this theory is actually an integral part of the standard model. We actually need it not just to explain mass, but to make our predictions make sense because our predictions are rubbish without it. We keep on getting infinities, things that tell us that we quite clearly don't understand what we're doing. We need this theory to patch up our predictions inside the standard model. So this theory that explains mass has played its part in every single successful prediction that's been verified by experiment. And yet it's just a theory. And it's just a theory because it's one prediction. The existence of this Higgs particle 
Well, it's never been proven. We've never seen a Higgs particle, and that's despite man years of effort devoted in looking for the thing. And that is the problem, because if we don't see the Higgs, we can't be sure that this exists. And if the Higgs doesn't exist, then the theory that predicts it must exist must be wrong. And if that theory is wrong, then this is very, very, very serious, because it means our whole standard model, which is founded and rests upon that theory, must also be wrong. And in that case, we quite literally have to go back to the drawing board, rip up our understanding of, of the fundamental universe and start from a completely different perspective, a completely different perspective which is unknown to us at present. So this is why the search for the Higgs is so important to particle physics, not just because it explains mass, but also because we need it to tell us whether our existing understanding of the universe in the standard model is correct or not. So, the standard model is great, but we haven't proven it at all. We're still in the process of trying to do that. That's the first problem. <laughs> second problem. The second problem concerns something really quite different, and that's the science fiction-y type of thing called antimatter. Now, the problem is this. In the Big Bang, we think we had equal amounts of matter and antimatter being created. But if we look at the universe around us now, we only see one type, which we've called normal matter. And we know this because the hallmark of antimatter is when it meets normal matter, it annihilates, releasing tremendous amounts of energy. A quarter of a gram of antimatter, for example, if you get it in contact with a quarter of a gram of normal matter, has the explosive force of five kilotons of TNT. It's a noticeable reaction. You would see it if it was happening around you. Now, we don't see it. We don't see it. We don't see it anywhere on Earth. We don't see it anywhere out in the universe where we look. And we are looking to try and find it. It just genuinely does not seem to be around. However, th this process of annihilation did go on all the time in the very early universe. Matter and antimatter particles met and annihilated, releasing photons of energy that would then produce new pairs of matter and antimatter particles in turn. And as the universe expanded and cooled, this carried on until about a minute or so after the Big Bang, there was no longer enough energy involved in these annihilations for the photons to produce new pairs of matter and antimatter particles. And this whole cosmic battle between matter and antimatter just stopped at that time. So what we have in the universe now is a consequence of a very tiny difference in the amount of matter and antimatter that existed after a minute, when the universe was a minute old. Very tiny, really tiny. And yet, it's that difference which means we're here. Because if there was no difference at all between matter and antimatter, the universe now would just be full of light. There'd be no planets, there'd be no stars, there'd be no us. So if we want to understand how the universe evolved to get here, then we need to understand why antimatter is that little bit different to normal matter. We don't know why. Our, ex our theory doesn't predict why or explain it. It's something that we have to try and find out by experiment. So that's problem number two, a completely unknown quantity. Problem number three is even bigger still. I've only told you about the visible universe, and cosmologists tell us that's only 4% of the whole thing, a mere fraction. Some 23% of the universe is made of something elusive called dark matter, and a whopping 73% is made of something elusive called dark energy. Now, <laughs> in particle physics, we have absolutely no idea what dark energy is, and we also have, to be fair, no idea what dark matter is either. <laughs> But, but we do have theories that hypothesize what dark matter at least could be made of. And these are theories that we can test experimentally. And one of the favorite theories at the moment for explaining dark matter is a theory called supersymmetry. Now, the supersymmetry involved just comes about because this, um, this theory introduces a relationship between matter particles and force-carrying particles. And the way it does this is to introduce a raft of new types of fundamental particles, such that the supersymmetry, or SUSY, particle partners of matter particles behave like force-carrying particles, and the SUSY partners of force-carrying particles behave like matter particles. Wonderful. The key thing from the point of view of dark matter is that the lightest supersymmetric particle displays all the property of dark matter. It's massive, so it experiences gravity, 
and it's completely experimentally unobservable, just like dark matter. <laughs> and that makes it the wonderful candidate it is. So you might think it's daft to try and predict something you can't see to explain something you can't see. Well, it does fit the evidence. But, <laughs> but the, the key to supersymmetry is that if it really does describe nature, we would expect to see all these other particles being produced in our experiments, and that's the key. If we make new discoveries, if we measure the properties of these new particles, and they fit with what supersymmetry predicts, then we'd infer the existence of this other particle that could then tell us the composition of far more of the universe. However, we haven't done so yet. It's just a hypothesis. So those are three things we don't know. And they're not the only things we don't know by any means. There are many other open questions. And these are just the known unknowns. Who knows about the unknown unknowns? Who knows where they come from? The key to making progress and understanding more, though, is to perform experiment. It's the only way you can make progress in understanding what's out there. So if you're an experimental particle physicist wanting to solve these problems like me, then you have to go to a special particle physics facility to perform your experiments. And as you heard in the introduction, I am a member of CERN, the European Centre for Particle Physics, based in Geneva. And although CERN started life just after the Second World War as a European Centre for Particle Physics, now it's really a world centre. It's like the UN of particle physics, if you like. Because particle physicists from all over the world come here to perform their experiments and to try and investigate the universe at these very deep levels. And it is the most amazing and exciting place at the moment. Mostly, of course, because it is the home of the Large Hadron Collider. And this is what I want to talk about now. The Large Hadron Collider, our most powerful, newest, particle acceleration facility. It is just amazing and mind-blowing in all aspects. It occupies a tunnel that's 27 kilometers long, a circular tunnel. You can just see it outlined in red on this aerial photograph. So to put it in context for what you can see, you have the Alps in the background, for those of you who like walking or skiing. This is Lake Geneva, and the city of Geneva is just at one end. And the path of the accelerator is shown here in the circle. It passes through Switzerland up here and France down here. Yeah, you know, very European. Now, of course, if you, if you fly over the Geneva countryside, you, you see no evidence of this because the tunnel's 100 metres underground. If you go underground and look at it, and you can, by the way, because CERN is open to the public, and as long as we're not running, you can actually visit the accelerator, you'll find yourself standing in a tunnel that looks like this, very similar, actually, to a London underground tunnel, but perhaps a little more high-tech, <laughs> <laughs> with more lights on. <laughs> and... What can you see? Well, you can see a long, continuous chain of blue magnets. These are the heart of the accelerating facility. And in the distance, if you look, you can just see the tunnel start to curve round in a circle. Because it's so big, you don't see that curvature very well. But you can see that there is some curvature right in the far distance. Now, what goes on in this accelerator is that we have two beams of protons. And they circulate in opposite directions around it. And they're accelerated to enormous energies by these magnets, such that at design spec, these protons will be accelerated until they're traveling at just 20 kilometers an hour less than the speed of light. Absolutely incredible. And then when we've done that, and it doesn't take very long, by the way, only about 20 minutes, we bring these beams into collision, we focus them at four points around the ring. And around each point, we've built a large experiment to take a snapshot of what happens. And we don't just do this once or twice. We do it 40 million times a second. It really is incredible. Even more incredible when you're considering what actually happens in any one of those collisions. Because in a tiny, tiny area of space, for the smallest instance of time, what we're doing in that particle accelerator is recreating temperatures so hot that they last existed in the universe a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. That means we're recreating matter in the state it was last in a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. We're recreating it in terms of fundamental particles, which we can then study using our experiments. So how does it work? Well, I have an animation here that, that I'm, I'm not sure how clear it is to see. But you can see clearly here there's a collision. When you have a collision between protons, you get new particles being produced. 
It's a job of the experiment that we build around this collision region to detect these particles, to make measurements of their paths, their energies, and store this so that we can analyze what's happened offline and then try and match it to what we expect to happen. Now, all of our experiments at the LHC, and there are four major experiments, ATLAS and CMS are, are the really big main ones, and LHCB, which I work on, and ALICE, which is an, another specialist one, they're all built on the same principles. If you deconstruct them, every experiment is composed of layers of detectors which each have a different job. So immediately around the collision point, we have what we call tracking detectors. These provide very precise points that allow us to trace a particle's path, a charged particle's path, as it goes through our experiment by leaving little trails of ionization that we can collect. After that, we make measurements of the particle's energy, depending on the type of force it interacts with. And then if any particle manages to make it out of this slot to the rest of the detector, and we detect it, it can only be one type, which is a very weakly interacting type of lepton called a muon. So, in other words, we can use our experiments to identify particles by the characteristic signatures that they leave inside them. And if we record this information and we analyze it with computers, then we can quantify it. We can calculate where those particles went, how much energy they have, exactly what they were doing. And if we combine this with our theory that tells us how particles behave, we can infer what fundamental process went on inside that collision. And if we do this many, many times, over and over and over again, from this series of snapshots that we've taken of the very early universe, we can build up a much bigger picture of how matter operates, what exists in matter at the most fundamental level, what sticks it together, and how it behaves. And this is how we do our research. Now, it sounds relatively straightforward like that, but the technologies involved are vast. So even the technologies that we use to build the detection devices are amazing. Ian mentioned some of these. We have detectors like this. I have to show this one. It was made in my university, so I feel a great pride when I show it. This is a silicon-based detector. The silicon is the active part. It's the silver semicircle you see behind me. This detector is so precise. It can measure the position of a charged particle going through it to within a tenth of the thickness of your hair. Absolutely amazing for such a large experiment that you can measure things so precisely. And every experiment at the LHC has a whole array of these devices that they use to trace out where things are going. But our experiments are big. They are the size of five-story buildings. By the time you get to the outermost layers of the detectors, so-called muon chambers, they get very big indeed. This is a picture taken during construction of the muon detectors on the Atlas experiment. And what you see here are two physicists who are just busy cabling up the last part of this section. When it's finished, it will bolt onto here and complete the whole detector. Now, to get to where they're working, they're standing on a platform, and this platform is suspended by a crane, which is 20 meters above the surface of the cavern that houses the experiment. 20 meters. That is a huge device. And that's something of the hallmark of these experiments. They are so big that you almost invariably need a crane to do anything on them. They are incredibly complex. And this also means that they generate an incredibly large amount of data. This experiment has something like 100 million channels of electronic information that you have to record for a, any collision you want to keep. It has thousands of kilometers of cable to send these signals through and to collect at the other side. And the amount of data generated by the LHC experiments is just enormous. When the LHC is going at full tilt, it will produce a million times more information per year than the world annual book production. And this is a size data set you need to analyze in order to investigate the universe. Now, you can do it if you have about 10,000 computers at your disposal. It's not something you can do on your desktop or your laptop at CERN uh, at home. So to meet that last challenge, computer physicists at CERN have developed something called the grid, which is a way of linking together every particle physicist's computers. We have enough particle physicists working on the LHC to do this. And the grid is 
a piece of software that makes their computers behave like a geographically distributed supercomputer that's powerful enough to meet the number crunching needs that we have. And the grid exists and it works. So that's the LHCs. Another big question, is it working? What's it doing and what have we found? Well, is it working first of all? You may remember it started up in 2008 and it stopped again shortly afterwards. That was a bad time. We spent over a year mending the magnets where we had that catastrophic loss of helium, introducing new safety systems to limit anything like that ever happening again. Until eventually, late in 2009, very, very gingerly, the accelerator started up again. So did it work? Well, <laughs> this is what it looks like if you've been working on this project for over a year, just hoping, hoping it's going to work this time. This is a picture taken in the, the LHC control room when they were circulating the beams and getting the first collisions. These are accelerator physicists who are happy <laughs> and relieved. Now, ever since then, the LHC has been improving and improving and improving. And for the past year and a half, really, it's come of age in terms of delivering a large amount of data to us. When we started off, we really didn't produce much data at all. Our proton beams, which consist, they're not continuous, they consist of bunches of protons, only had one bunch per beam, tiny. We weren't, we, we weren't collecting much data. Well, by the end of last year, we've got that up to 400 bunches per beam, which is still way short of the design of almost 3,000 per beam, but still better than nothing. This year, the performance has really taken off. We're up to 1,300 bunches per beam, so we're over halfway to the design um, strength of the beams. And we've been running like that for a while. And that means that the amount of data we've collected has been really quite immense, quite unusual for a particle accelerator that normally takes a lot longer to get going and be understood than the LHC. So the plot I have here just shows you how much data the experiments have collected as a function of time in 2011. And the main experiments, Atlas and CMS, have collected the most. They've collected, well, the unit here is barns, which is, well, I always think is a very strange unit, or five inverse femta barns. To put that in context, that's about half of the nominal amount we would expect when the LHC is running at full tilt. So to have it going in this, at this stage is really remarkable. LHCB have collected about one inverse femta barn, about 20% of the data, because we, we run at um, slightly lower beam strengths, and Alice lower still. But the point is, there's tons of data there to analyze, tons of data to understand the universe with. So the first thing you have to do is to make sure you understand what your equipment's doing. So summer 2010, this is what we were doing. We were taking particles whose properties we knew very well and looking to see what they looked like in our experiments. And if they looked like we expect, then that gave us confidence that we had calibrated our experiments correctly and we understood their response. And what I have here is a couple of what we call event displays, they're like cartoons, that show a couple of these particles that were produced in collisions. So on the left-hand side, from the Atlas experiment, we have a W boson, remember, one of the carriers of the weak force, that's decayed to a muon that we see and a neutrino that we don't see. This muon is marked in red here. This is the very distinctive signature, although you'll have to take my word for it that it's, it's very easily picked out from this... this this sort of diagram which shows our experiment as layers of the detectors that I was telling you about before. I have a picture from LHCB, which I'm very proud of. It's on my phone. I like it so much. <laughs> this, I, I'm not joking, sadly enough. <laughs> this is a Z boson. Again, another carrier of the weak force, which here is decayed to two muons. And those are the two thick lines that you see here. And again, these layers, these concentric circles, represent the response of the different layers of detection in the experiment. So that behaved as we thought it would. That's great. So then it meant we could move on and start to quantify what we were seeing a little bit more precisely and to start testing theoretical predictions to see if the standard model was still holding at LHC energies. So the first results that came out tested the strong force. And what we could do was measure how often we saw quarks being produced in collisions. 
And that's shown on this plot here. So the y-axis shows you the rate at which quarks are produced as a function of their energy on the x-axis. And this measurement was carried out in different regions of the Atlas detector in this case, which gives you these different curves. And the data points are the points, and the lines, which are, look like they're superimposed on top, are our theoretical predictions. You see how close they are. What that's telling us is that the standard model, at least our understanding of this force, is really good. It really works at the LHC because it's, it's predicting exactly what we're seeing. So our understanding of the strong force inside the LHC looks spot on, which is really reassuring. Well, we can move on from the strong force and test the other types of forces. We can test the weak force, the electromagnetic force. We can take those snapshots of W and Z bosons and look to see how often they're produced. We've done that, so there's a summary here from the CMS experiment. You don't have to look at it preci very precisely. It's just a list of all the measurements that have been made involving W bosons or Z bosons in various ways. And they're all presented as the ratio of what's measured in data to the theoretical prediction. What's measured in data is the point, the line is theory. And in almost every case, they line up exactly on top of each other. This is how good the standard model is. It's predicting precisely what we're seeing in the experiments. So those forces look to be well described as well. Fantastic. And this is really good because it means that we have a good basis now for starting to look for the unexpected because we understand the things that we know about very, very well. So what else can we look at? Well, we can take particles that we don't know very much about. And one of these is the top quark. This was only discovered in 1994. And until the LHC, it was only possible to study it at the Tevatron, the big accelerator in America, which, until it stopped at the end of last September, was the main competition to the LHC. Well, if you wanted to study top quarks, you had to go to Fermilab, or you had to buy the soft toy version that, <laughs> that some enterprising physicists set up as a sideline. But now, if you're in Europe, you don't even have to send away for that. You can do the measurements at the LHC. And CMS and the Atlas experiment are making measurements that are becoming more and more precise of how often this type of quark that's, that's relatively unknown is, is produced and what its properties are. And again, you can see from the picture behind me that the data measurements, the points, lie on top of the band, which is our theory prediction. It's all coincident. Again, the standard model can describe this very, very well. Great. Well, so far, so good. Well, it's not the whole story, though, because if that's all the LHC does, you might be asking why we've built it and what was the point in spending that much money in building something that just tells us what we already know. So what about the stuff that we don't know? What about the big questions that I mentioned right at the beginning? What's the LHC told us about that? Well, interesting, because we're now in a position to really start investigating them. So let's start with the first one, the Higgs. Now, we have a theory that although it doesn't predict, it, it predicts the existence of the Higgs particle, but it doesn't predict how heavy it is although it predicts many of the properties of this particle depending on the mass of that particle. Very frustrating. It doesn't really pin it down sufficiently for you to know exactly where to look for it. You have to find it, and then everything else falls into place. Now, what we can do with our theory is we can take measurements, all the measurements we've made so far of standard model processes, so involving W bosons, Z bosons, and the rest, and we can see what value of a Higgs mass is consistent with the theory and with those experimental results. And that's shown somewhat obliquely on the picture behind me. This is a measure of the probability on the y-axis of a Higgs mass being consistent with our theory and what we've seen in our data as a function of the Higgs mass on the x-axis. And the most probable value of the Higgs mass is where this plot is a minimum. So according to our theory, we should expect to see the Higgs, if it exists, and it's like we expect, all these caveats, we should expect to see it with a mass of about 90 or 100 GeV, which are our normal mass units in particle physics. Wonderful. 
OK, that's what the theory tells us. Now, of course, we can also look for it directly, and we have done. And looking for it directly has meant that we know that it's not in any of the regions in yellow, because those have been ruled out already by previous experiments. We know that there's no Higgs with a mass below 114.5 GeV, because experiments at LEP would have seen it, and they didn't, so it's not there. And we know that the Higgs cannot have a mass in this very restricted band here at 150, 160, 170 GeV, otherwise the Tevatron experiments would have seen it in the amount of data they've analysed so far. And they haven't, so it's not there either. So the Higgs can only be in a very narrow region. If our theory is correct, it's got to have this mass, otherwise it's, it's, it's improbable, it's unlikely to happen. And that means we can devise strategies for looking for it. Now, before we had all the data, of course, all the LHC experiments were devising strategies to find it. It's very important to us. It's one of the main reasons why we constructed the LHC, to establish whether it exists or not. The plot behind me is one such study from the Atlas experiment that shows the different curves show how much data you would need to rule out the existence of a Higgs. Where these curves fall below one on the y-axis, that's where you can rule out the Higgs with that much data. And it's all shown as a function of the Higgs mass on the x-axis. So this summer, we had about one inverse femtobahn of data. And that corresponds to the black line that you can see here, the second one down. So by this summer, Atlas and CMS would have expected, if the Higgs wasn't there, to have ruled out its existence down to about 130 GeV. Now you can see we have five inverse femtobahns. That's the bottom plot. Once we've analysed that data, we should be able to rule out the Higgs, if it's not there, through the whole region. And that's very significant. Because if the Higgs isn't there, what's in our theory isn't right. Woohoo! <laughs> Exactly. This is a really exciting time. So what happened in the summer was really the first results coming out. So we have what we call summer conferences in July and August. For the first summer conference in July, Atlas and CMS reported their results for the very first time. And this was really very interesting from the sort of, I don't know, the philosophical, sociological point of view. It was absolutely amazing that these huge collaborations of people, 3,000 in each of them, had managed to keep this secret and not talk to each other. But they really genuinely didn't know what the other experiment was going to show. So Atlas went up first, gave their talk, and showed this as a result. Now, it looks a bit ropey because there wasn't that much data. But what it's showing you is a very similar plot to that simulation study you saw be before. Basically, when this curve drops below 1, that's the region that you exclude of the Higgs. Again, it's shown as a function of Higgs mass. Now, there are two things on this plot. There's a solid black line. That's what's come out of the data. That's what Atlas are measuring. And you can compare that to what you expect from your simulation studies, and that's the coloured green and yellow band. Now, what's interesting here is that there is an area that's being excluded, but there's also an area, if you look just below that in mass, where the data are higher than you'd expect. And what that means is you have extra events in your data where you didn't expect them. And what that implies is that there's something else there that's not in the standard model. Maybe Higgs, maybe something else, maybe a mistake. So CMS went up next, and this is what they showed. <gasps> and this was so interesting, because look at it. It's got the same bulk properties. It rules out the same region. It's got the same excess at slightly lower masses. This is what made this particular result so compelling to us over the summer. Because one experiment seeing it, it's interesting, but two experiments seeing it independently makes it very intriguing. There's either something there that you're seeing the first hints of, or there's something in common to both which isn't quite right. Either way, you don't have enough data to tell. The first hints. And of course, this was all over the news because the BBC went to this conference and started reporting frantically. So they picked up on the fact we were all really excited. That was quite obvious, I think. <laughs> that was on the 23rd of July. The next day, 
we had an example of the Me Too syndrome from the Fermilab Tenetron, who also figured out that there was a very slight excess in the same region over there as well. Not statistically significant, possible. Okay. All right. We all share. It's fine. The next day, of course, we're, we're still all really excited. Are we closing on, on the elusive Higgs? Wonderful, wonderful. We're on the edge of our seats. We don't know. We don't know. It's the first hints. Very exciting. We have to wait for more data to be analysed. And so by the final summer conference, the one in August, there is more data analysed. And these are the results from Atlas and CMS. Now, they, they look basically the same. We're able to exclude slightly more, and that's... Um, you'd expect that because you're analysing more data. But the thing that was really, really intriguing before, the fact that this data lay so far above our, our prediction, well, that hasn't got any more significant. If anything, it's got a little less significant with the amount of data that we've analysed. So the jury's really out on this one. We still don't have enough data analysed to know whether we saw a fluctuation that somehow fluctuated up for both experiments before whether there was a mistake in the analyses, which is possible because they were very new, or whether there's something there that nature has conspired against giving you any more of in the meantime. So the BBC did their best with this story. <laughs> so the Higgs boson range is narrowing. That was the good news. We're ruling out more of its existence, you know, but it's a bit of a downer. And then by about, I don't know, 10 days later, they become optimistic again and, re and realise that, well, maybe by Christmas we'll find it. <laughs> And this isn't a stupid thing to say, because you've seen how much data we have on hand now. We have five inverse femtobarns that we can now analyse. And that is sufficient to really check this region where we saw that tantalising hint of a discrepancy. So by the end of the year, that will be analysed. So I hope very much that by the end of the year, beginning of next year, that we will have some more definitive statement on what's in that region. That's why it's so exciting at the moment for this particular question. That, okay, so that's, that's the missing link in the standard model. What about beyond the standard model? Because we've also constructed the LHC to look beyond our current understanding, to find a deeper understanding. We need evidence for it. We need to know where to look. Well, you might remember when LHC started up, there was a lot of discussion about black hole production. And we all reassured you that there was no such thing. It wouldn't happen. But, of course, it didn't stop us looking. <laughs> and when you have 3,000 collaborators on an experiment, some of them have to do something. And luckily, there's no evidence for black hole production, which is why I've put this in. And no matter what crazy theory you look at, no matter how many extra dimensions of space you invoke, there is no evidence. So, no black holes. More interestingly, though, what about supersymmetry? Because this is a serious theory, and we're hoping that it might explain dark matter. Well, we have had results for supersymmetry in the summer conferences. We have searched the data looking for evidence of these new supersymmetric particles. And we haven't found anything. We haven't found any evidence of anything untoward yet. And, well, that hasn't... This was the BBC story, I think, of the summer conference, seeing as Higgs wasn't going to deliver. They, they had supersymmetry instead. So this, this hasn't killed off supersymmetry, the fact that we haven't found anything, but it's made certain variants of it, which admittedly are a little unnatural, it's, it's ruled those out. So the LHC hasn't disproved supersymmetry, but it has said that not all supersymmetry can describe the data. And it has been a surprise to certain theorists that we haven't made any discoveries of supersymmetry yet. There's great depression if you're a supersymmetric theorist because I'm afraid you haven't been vindicated yet. But never mind. That's, that's the universe. Maybe supersymmetry does not describe it at all. Maybe that's what we're seeing. We don't know yet. We haven't ruled it out. We need to analyse more data to explore more possibilities because supersymmetry isn't a very well-constrained hypothesis. But so far... There's no evidence of it. And what about something completely open? We also perform what we call model independent searches, which is where we take a process, like on LHCB, and we don't look directly for a new particle, but we look indirectly for the effects of something beyond our current understanding contributing and making what we see different to a prediction. So for LHCB, we have one particular channel that we like to do this, 
It's a particular type of what we call a B meson. This is a particle that contains a B quark and an antimatter S quark. And very, very occasionally, this decays to two muons. This is a really good experimental signature to find. And the, the wonderful thing about this, from our point of view, is that in the, in the standard model, this hardly ever happens. You hardly ever get this happening. But almost any other variety of new physics mechanism will provide different ways to produce these two muons. And you'd see a much higher rate of production than you would expect. And what you see behind me is, I'm afraid, a very sort of workmanlike physicist event display that shows you a candidate B sub S meson decaying to two muons. Now, the characteristic signature of anything containing a B quark is that a B quark lives for a finite time, about 10 to the minus 13 seconds. Not very long, but they're traveling fast enough to cover about a centimeter's ground before they decay. And that means, with the aid of the very precise path and tracking that we have um, inside our experiments. You can trace that not only where particles are produced at the interaction point over here, but you can find that your two muons come from a point which is significantly different over here. And that's a hallmark of this particular particle having been produced. So we've studied this, and unfortunately we haven't seen anything untoward there either. And this is a different type of search for new physics we can perform, an indirect search, because we're not seeing it directly. We're seeing its effects through something. And this is quite powerful, because it allows us to be open to the effects of things at much higher energy scales. But still, there's nothing there yet. We need to analyze more data. Now, where we're seeing things that we don't understand are coming in under, perhaps, the unknown unknowns. We saw something late last year that we didn't understand at all. And this is when the LHC changed from colliding beams of protons to beams of heavy ions. And these simulate conditions of the universe about a microsecond after the Big Bang. Later times, it's when quarks were starting to coalesce into protons and neutrons. Now, what we saw is that particles produced in these collisions seemed to know where the others were going. There seemed to be some sort of spatial correlation in the way they were arranged in our experiments. You can see these, this funny peaked structure in the plot behind me that shows that some of the angles of their production are more common than others. Now, this hints to us that there's some sort of coherence effect going on amongst these particles. And we think it's perhaps a, a sign of some new phase of matter that these free particles are collapsing into before they turn into protons and neutrons. Something we hadn't expected at all. Something that we have no theory even to try and explain. And so what's going to happen later this year is that we'll do more running with the LHC. We'll, we'll take a greater event sample so that we can study this effect in more detail and try and learn more about it. Now, I also mentioned at the beginning a one of my big questions, seeing as I've knocked off the Higgs and told you that, well, we're, we're on our way to finding out about that, and dark matter, well, it looks like supersymmetry isn't delivering anything yet. I also mentioned antimatter. Now, we've had some news on that this year. Not just from the LHC either. In fact, mainly not from the LHC, so this is one of my non-LHC news items. You may remember earlier on in the year, last June, an experiment called Alpha made the headlines because it had produced anti-hydrogen atoms. So that's an anti-proton orbited by an anti-electron, a genuine anti-atom. And not only that, but it had managed to hold these things in one place for almost a quarter of an hour. Now, that doesn't sound like much, particularly when you look at the quantities involved, particularly if you saw the film Angels or Demons and you've, and you've read the book. It's nothing compared to that. We're nowhere near. But it is really, really, really amazing in terms of a step forward in our ability to understand what goes on with antimatter. Because holding antimatter in one place for this length of time means that you can study it directly. You can make measurements of this anti-hydrogen atom and compare it to the properties of a normal matter hydrogen atom. You can look at its spectra, its energy levels, and so forth, and compare them one to one. Now, it is really difficult, if you think about it, to hold something neutral in confinement, because don't forget what happens with antimatter. As soon as an antihydrogen atom touches the walls of the container, it goes up. <laughs> you lose it. And so Alpha have had to develop a very sophisticated way to suspend these antihydrogen atoms using magnetic fields in order to hold them away from the container, in order to be able to store them for this length of time. 
So now alpha are making measurements of these anti-hydrogen atoms to make this one-to-one -one comparison, and they're trying to get greater, larger event samples to make more significant measurements as well. And perhaps this approach is going to really tell us what the difference between antimatter and matter is. We, don't, we know there must be a difference, but we don't know what it is. So finding any difference will help us. Now, of course, we can also study antimatter at the LHC, and that's what my experiment, LHCb, is designed to do. LHC produces matter and antimatter equally copiously in the collisions. Well, it, with LHCb, we're starting to make our first measurements of matter particles and antimatter particles and comparing them, but this is a rather longer-term analysis. We need a lot of data, and we need and to analyse it very precisely. So we don't really have results yet. Expect results on this to come out next year. I think that's about the time scale. And then from then on, we should be able to explore the properties of matter and antimatter in this indirect method. Because remember, we only see the aftermath of collisions and have to infer what went on. Alpha can look at this stuff directly. So it's a very complementary approach. And hopefully, fingers crossed, it's going to yield some information into the, the distinct nature of matter and antimatter. And finally, we have to remember that I've given you a list of questions, I've given you a list of unknowns, but you've always got to keep your mind open because none of us really know what the universe is and how it behaves and, and what might be out there. And we had a good reminder of that a few weeks ago, very, very recently, by an experiment which isn't a CERN experiment, but it uses an accelerator from CERN which shoots a beam of neutrinos to an experiment buried in a mountain somewhere in Italy at a place called Gran Sasso. And this experiment, called OPERA, made a measurement of how fast those neutrinos were travelling and made a measurement that was significant and said that they were travelling faster than the speed of light. About seven kilometres an hour faster than the speed of light, I think. Close, but significantly over. And that is just bizarre. I mean, according to the laws of physics that we know about, that cannot happen. And this... This is such an exciting thing because, of course, we're trying to understand how it can happen. We're trying to correlate these results with other results that might be com um, comparable, give us information. We're trying to use other neutrino experiments around the world to make the same sort of measurement to see if they can verify it. We're trying to find out if there are co additional causes of uncertainty in this measurement that haven't been considered yet, which might explain why the neutrinos apparently seem to have a speed faster than the speed of light but don't actually. And then, on the other hand, we're also trying to work out what the implications of this are, would be. At CERN, last Friday, there was a whole morning devoted to theorists discussing how they could salvage Einstein's theory of special relativity and let neutrinos go faster than the speed of light. <laughs> I mean, well, they're earning their money, that's all I can say. So, we don't know what's happening here. If you want to know more about this, and you're a fast runner, there's, there's a documentary tonight on BBC Two at 9pm. Um, if, you, if you can't make it back in time, use BBC, Two, use BBC iPlayer. That should summarise the state of the art in terms of experiment and theory and what we understand about the measurements so far. It's a very rapidly moving field at the moment, but to me it's a very salutary reminder that we don't know everything that we think we know. We should always be prepared to be surprised. We should always make sure we understand what's happening to the best of our knowledge, but we shouldn't discount the unusual either. So, let me start to conclude. So, I've shown you our latest results. I've shown you what's come out of the LHC so far. So, what's happening next is that we're taking data more or less continuously now for the rest of this year and all of next year. And the motivation behind this was to collect a large enough data sample to be able to say something about the Higgs, to be able to say if, it, if we see a hint, to be able to prove that it's there to the level of statistical significance that we, that we need for a discovery. Then we shut down for a year, 18 months. We go round all the magnets in the accelerator, we test them, we upgrade them, and then we start up again, running not at the half nominal energies that we're running at at the moment, but running as near to the nominal energies as we can get to. We want to do this because we want to extend our particle searches to as high energies as it's possible to make. So the status is we're collecting tons of data. You've seen we've collected a lot. The experiments are working really well. 
we're working really hard <laughs> trying to analyze the data, and results are just streaming out all the time. So expect really interesting results to come out by the end of this year on the Higgs, next year on more longer term things like antimatter. But as to what we'll find, well, your guess is as good as mine. We didn't know what was going to be out there when we started the LHC. We hoped it was going to supply the answer to some of these questions. You've seen that we're well on our way to at least addressing the first one. You've seen that the LHC hasn't given us any hints yet about dark matter. You've seen that we haven't got enough data yet to tackle antimatter. But again, we're getting there with the, um, the LHC and elsewhere. But as to what we'll actually find when this experiment has run its course, who knows? I mean, I really hope that we're going to answer these big questions that we have. I really hope we're going to throw up more big questions in turn that are going to enlighten us and develop our understanding of the universe and move it beyond where we are at the moment. But we'll just have to wait and see, because nobody knows this one. It's pure research. The LHC is really taking us on a voyage of discovery throughout the universe, a scientific adventure. And at least you can all follow it, because it's so easy to follow. When we have a result that we're interested in, you can follow it on the web, on the news, in blogs, on Twitter, you name it. We're such gossips, it just leaks. So keep your eyes open if you're interested, and then you can follow us with what we're hoping to discover. Thank you.